Uh, welcome to GitLab CI, a template for reusability. Um, I'm Francis, and I'm a project specialist at Coldfront Labs. I work on automating uh, tests and workflows for our projects. And I'm Nick. Uh, I do a lot of like front-end JavaScript stuff at Coldfront Labs, as well as Drupal theming and a little bit of uh, module development. So today we're going to talk about GitLab CI, and uh, before we get into GitLab and what you can do, all the amazing things you can do with it, uh, we're going to quickly go and talk about continuous integration and what it is. Um, just a note on terminology, I'm going to use the words merge and merge request quite a bit today. Uh, these are similar to the terms pull and pull request uh, in other systems, um, but in GitLab you say merge, so just so I don't lose you on the terminology. Um, it, it has to do with the, uh, the practice of integrating code into a repository, or yeah, the act of integrating code into a repository. Um, so, uh, at its most basic, continuous integration is the practice of merging changes into a central repository on a regular basis and running automated processes, builds, tests, etc., to verify that the build is functional. Um, instead of keeping code on individual computers, developers merge their code into a shared repository frequently, generally on a daily basis or more often, um, so that everyone has access to the latest version of the code. Uh, depending on who you ask, there are anywhere between like thir three and 30 uh, principles of CI. Today we're gonna keep things simple and highlight just a few uh, that everyone pretty much agrees on. Uh, the main tenet, I guess, would be that code is stored, maintained, and updated in a single central repository. Um, this doesn't mean on your production web server. This means by <laughs> a um, version control system, <laughs> such as Git. <laughs> um, changes to the code should be small and modular and merged in on a regular basis. And every commit should be tested. Automated self-testing builds should be run to ensure that the build is working. So some of the benefits of CI have to do with reducing time spent tracking down bugs, speeding up code integration, and increasing visibility and transparency. Uh, because you're constantly running tests on your code, bugs are found quickly. It's also generally easy to isolate uh, a bug, because, or the cause of a bug, because code changes are kept small and uh, in small manageable chunks. Another benefit of making incremental changes is that there's less likelihood of integration conflicts. Uh, when con coding conflicts do arise, uh, they're generally pretty easy to deal with because you're only dealing with a small um, number of changes. Um, that decreases the uh, chance of making mistakes when dealing with conflicts and also avoids compounding issues from arising. Since the code is stored in a single place, everyone always has access to the latest version and can tell the status of the build at any time without having to track down individuals and ask like, how a feature is doing or where a bug is at or all of that stuff. So the major takeaway about CI is that it saves you time. Having everything in well-tested, manageable chunks speeds up the development process and your automated CI processes give you confidence in your code because it is being built and tested um, with each commit. So the workflow for the CI process is simple. You have your central repository where your code is saved. Um, this might be your master branch if you're using Git. And changes to this code are made by making copies of the code and merging in small changes back to the main repository on a regular basis. In our project, we follow a feature branch um, workflow for CI. We create branches of code for building and testing, and then these branches are merged back into our main uh, master branch. Finally, processes such as code, code checks tests and builds are automated so that they are run on every commit. Every change you make to your code is tested and verified. Some examples of automated tasks include running a linter to check your coding syntax and standards, um, running compilers to ensure your code is building, and uh, running validation tests to ensure that functionality is working and everything is, or and to check for regressions too. Um, whether using feature branches or committing directly to the master branch, it's important to remember the continuous in continuous integration. 
To realize the benefits of CI, you have to commit often and keep changes to a reasonable size. For example, it's much easier to read something like this, in which a dependency, a single dependency, has been added to the project, than to read something like this, where there are many, many changes, like images being added, dependencies added, um, components created, and configurations changed all in a single uh, change. So, sure, you can read through large volumes of changes, but it's much quicker to deal with things in those small chunks that we talked about previously. Okay, so Nick told me I shouldn't spring uh, pop quizzes and presentations, but does anyone know what CD stands for? <laughs> so, so, just yell it out. Continuous delivery. Okay, continuous delivery. So actually, it was a bit of a trick question, but I guess it actually gave more people the opportunity to get it right. Um, can this continuous deployment or continuous delivery um, basically has is following the CI process, but then tacking on automated deployments to your um, automated processes. Um, these deployments might be um, triggered automatically, which would be continuous deployment, or continuous delivery, in which case you are manually triggering your deployments, but they're still part of your automated processes. Um, in our examples today, we're going to include automated deployments as part of our CI uh, process. All right. Okay, so, all right. So now that you all uh, are masters of the CI CD lifestyle, uh, we're going to get into our, our, our main topic here GitLab CI. Uh, so <laughs> before uh, we go into to the nitty gritty GitLab CI stuff, we're going to tell you why and how we use it. Uh, so the first and most obvious reason uh, is that GitLab, uh, we host a lot of our projects on GitLab, be it for internal use or personal projects or clients, um, and GitLab CI is built into GitLab and it's free to use. Uh, the next one is it's really easy to configure. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit later, but essentially all you have to do is add your GitLab CI file into the root of your repository and you're, you're done. It'll run every time you push. Uh, next, it offers uh, really good process control. Um, you could uh, run individual pipelines without necessarily having to make code changes. So if you just needed to run a test again, you could go through the GitLab UI, go into pipelines, and, and run your, your stuff uh, manually without having it to pick up on changes and go. Uh, and you can also save artifacts to your build. Um, and what this is basically, uh, when we run a production deployment, uh, GitLab CI saves a compiled code version of our build, which is the artifact, uh, so that we can go and download it later if we need to. If we need to figure out what went wrong or was it broken when we built it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and for those of you who know uh, our boss, <laughs> he also told us to use it, and so we had to. <laughs> Uh, so at Coldfront we use uh, GitLab CI for a lot of different things. Uh, we run a lot of code checks and linting uh, on uh, our PHP and our SAS and our JavaScript code. Uh, we use it to build and deploy our Drupal 7 and 8 sites, Vue.js projects, and even Docker images. Uh, and we run validation like Backstop, Codeception, uh, Axe, uh, and a couple other things on our sites. Uh, and we run security audits. Uh, using Drush, Composer, and NPM. Uh, so now that we've told you uh, what we use, uh, why we use it, and what we use it for, uh, let's start things off with some basic terminology. Uh, GitLab, the whole GitLab CI process are kind of broken down into four main things. Uh, runners, pipelines, stages, and jobs. Uh, so a runner is basically a machine, typically a virtual machine, uh, that takes all of your code from your repository, all the structures in your CI file, and basically ex ex executes any tasks. It runs things. 
Uh, GitLab provides a set of free runners for you to use if you're on gitlab.com. Uh, there are some usage limits. They're pretty high though. I think you are allowed to run 1,000 pipelines per month. Is it? Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, typically you would create your own runner so you don't run into any limitations and you can optimize it for your own processes. Uh, runners are what makes your CI process go. Uh, they run your pipelines. Uh, pipeline is a pretty generic thing, like it's the wrapper term for your jobs that you're running. Uh, it will basically just contains all your series of automated tasks that you run on your code and uh, they contain multiple stages. Uh, a stage is a category within your pipeline. Uh, you may have a lit stage or a build stage or a deploy stage, probably all of those things. Uh, and the order in which you declare the stages or the order in which they are run. Uh, they run consecutively, which means basically one stage must complete before the stages after it can begin to run. Uh, so like uh, the lint stage must finish before the build stage begins and the deploy stage has to wait for the builds to finish before it can also run. Uh, an important thing to know about your stages though is that while they define the general order of your pipeline, uh, they don't actually execute anything. Uh, that's what jobs are for. So a job is an individual task contained within the stage. Uh, it's where the functionality of all your CI processes are written. Uh, you can have multiple jobs contained within the same stage. Uh, so for example, when you're linting something, you probably maybe have JavaScript and SAS. So you're going to want to run tests on your ESLint for JavaScript, StyleLint for your SAS code. Uh, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to run ESLint and StyleLint in the exact same job. Uh, yes, they're both linting processes, but they're for two different languages. They should be separated into two different jobs. Uh, so within your lint stage, you could have a ESLint job and a style lint job. Uh, another important thing to remember about jobs is that unlike the stages that they're contained in, uh, they run in parallel. Uh, so when your lint stage begins, both your ESLint and your style lint jobs will start running at the exact same time. Uh, once as long as they're runners. As long as there are runs, yes. Uh, once all your jobs within a stage have completed, that stage is then completed itself, and then the next stage with all of the jobs inside of it can start running. So let's visualize. Uh, so here you can see we have some groupings of tasks. Uh, all of these tasks are what makes up your pipeline. Uh, within our pipeline, we have three categories lint, build, and deploy. These are our stages. Uh, within each stage, we can see some individual tasks. These are jobs. Uh, we have ES lint and style lint in the lint stage. We have a job called build in the build stage, and a job called deploy in the deploy stage. So when a pipeline begins, all the code and instructions are sent to your runner, and all the jobs within the first stage will begin to run. Uh, now, just because all the jobs started at the same time does not mean that they will finish at the same time. Uh, fortunately, before the build stage can begin, all of the jobs within the lint stage must succeed. Uh, once uh, all of the lint jobs have succeeded, our build can go. And this process basically just repeats throughout the whole pipeline. Each stage must finish before the next stage can begin. All right. So let's take a look at configuring a basic pipeline. Um, so Nick mentioned the uh, CI file, which is used to control your pipelines. Um, right, I forgot a slide which I always do. Here we go. <laughs> to create a pipeline. 
Um, so GitLab CI is controlled by a file called the GitLab CI YAML file. Um, this, as I mentioned, is used to tell uh, GitLab what to do. Um, d uh, it defines the pipeline. Uh, and GitLab will automatically detect this file when you place it at the root of your repository. So let's go have a look at that file. Um, so you can see at the top of this file, I have defined uh, the stages. Um, in this case, we have a super simple uh, example. We have three stages, lint, build, and deploy. Um, down here, you can see the jobs. I have an ES lint job in the lint stage, a build prod in the prod stage, or the build stage, and deploy in the deploy stage. Um, now, can any, to, to, to see how well you've been listening, can anyone tell me why we would have three stages when we only have three jobs and you know, we could just have them in a single stage? Why would we have these jobs in individual stages? So you can build and deploy at the same time. Exactly. So you need them to run uh, one after another. Um, so, in, uh, in this case, uh, you can see that we have um, very simple scripts. Uh, the scripts are what tells the runner exactly what to do during the job. Um, we just run a, a linter to check syntax, run a build, and then deploy that build out to a server. Um, you'll notice that in the build stage, we create an artifact. And that's what is used, uh, grabbed by our deploy stage, to copy over to our, um, to our web server. Um, let's go take a look at this in the GitLab UI. That's a little tiny. There we go. Sorry, I didn't check that one. That's okay. Um, so, oh, and something I didn't mention, I'll just flip back here. Um, you can control when artifacts ex expire. So you probably don't want these, um, you know, if you're, if you're building as much as we are, you probably don't want those artifacts sticking around too long. So you can control when, uh, how long you want GitLab to hold on to those for you. All right, so you can see that the latest, um, on the pipelines page of the GitLab UI, you can see uh, that I have my demo uh, branch here and I've actually had all the stages succeed. Um, you can click on a stage to see the builds that were uh, run within that stage. And you can see here that um, my linting task actually failed earlier. So let's go have a look at the terminal output for that job. Here you can see that it ran the npm install, which is fine, but it did fail on the npm run lint because of a syntax error on, uh, in my main.js file. If we go back to the pipeline um, after fixing the linting error, um, let's go have a look at that build that we, uh, that we ran. You can see here that those job artifacts can be accessed, downloaded, or you can browse to the files that were, uh, that were saved in that artifact we specified in the file. Um, you can also, uh, kind of a handy feature that I like is if you create merge requests, um, you can go and see the, stat the most recent status of the pipeline uh, that was run uh, against that branch for the merge request. Another uh, handy little tip, um, you, you can also run jobs again, which is something Nick mentioned, um, and you can also run whole pipelines if you, if you have a reason to, to want to run a specific branch um, at a later point. Okay, so going back to our um, GitLab CI file, um, I'm going to go to version two. Oops, there we go. Um, so something you might have picked up on in the last uh, version of the file, I'm not sure if anyone was paying that much attention, but uh, we had some repetition going on in our job scripts because I had npm install written in every script uh, parameter. Um, in this version, I've moved that up to the before script, which is a special keyword um, in GitLab CI, which will just run um, all of those commands you list in the before script array uh, prior to every job in the file. Uh, they all, there are also a series of other uh, keywords, such as after script, so that you can um, kind of reduce redundancy in this CI file 
Uh, as you can imagine, as we add jobs, things easily get, uh, you'd have a lot of repetition going on. In this uh, version of the file, I've also added um, two new deploy jobs. I've added a deploy dev and deploy QA because I didn't always want to be deploying to my production server. Um, once we introduce jobs like this, I don't actually want to run all three of those jobs every time I run the pipeline. So we've added these um, only and accept parameters to make sure that we deploy to dev um, whenever a commit is made to a branch, um, except in cases where we commit to the master branch. And then the deploy to QA will happen whenever we make a change to the master branch. Um, I've decided to trigger my deploying to prod manually because I don't want to accidentally have that happen um, at any point. So, the um, taking a look at these scripts, you can see that actually there's a lot of duplicated code here because pretty much everything is the same between my deploy um, jobs except for the location where I'm actually copying that build to. Um, this gets especially troublesome uh, when you imagine adding multiple validation jobs um, to all of your ser or to test code on all of your servers, um, and adding like we we get to the point where we have you know nine stages and probably twenty to thirty four. jobs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so if you're you know it, it it adds a lot of bulk to your CI file if you're repeating code. So, um, what's the answer to this problem of bloat? <laughs> Templates. <laughs> yep. Okay, so templates. Uh, the reason you probably have come to this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so GitLab CI templates are pretty much exactly what they sound like. Uh, they're pre-made jobs that you have created uh, that you can extend to fit the needs uh, of, your, of all your stages and uh, reduce the code. Uh, you can have scripts, stages, onlys, accepts, dependencies, anything that another job could have, that's what a template can also have. Uh, all of these parameters are inherited by the job uh, that's extending the template. Uh, and you can uh, customize and override each parameter whenever you need, uh, just in case you need something a little different. Uh, in our previous example, we had three different jobs for deploying to three different servers. Um, we could easily create a generic deploy template to handle all of these. Uh, so let's take a look at how we uh, would do that. So here we have our production deployment job. Uh, I've taken the liberty of removing some of the functional. Uh oh, the screen went away. Um, you mentioned package files. Yes. CI configuration file. What exactly did you just so it was from an result of a build? Essentially. Yeah, so. Uh, here, I'll let you. It, oh, it, it copies those files back to GitLab yeah. so that they're attached to the job and so that they're accessible by the other runners the to, to use in the addition yeah. of the following code. Why would anyone use it? Sorry. Um, because like if you compile your code and then the next job um, needs to deploy that code, it needs to be able to access that. So yeah, it just makes the, the next job be able to um, yeah. So GitLab has like a storage for all of this stuff as well? It's uh, it has some temporary storage okay. that you can use. Uh, typically, you would make your own caching server. Okay, so you deploy uh, your you artifacts are not stored on GitLab. Stored uh, no, not ours. Okay. We, yeah. Uh, for the most part, we also have our own GitLab instance, so we control the whole yeah. server. Uh, yep. Uh, I noticed you used uh, npm install. Yes. Have you ever used NPM uh, CI? We sure do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually just had a build issue when I was like okay. trying to make the demo, and I wasn't going to troubleshoot it, so I just <laughs> went back to install. We're recording. Yeah. Yeah. It's faster and whatever. It's faster and, it's and the log files are <laughs> Because fun fact, 
your npm locks, like the package-lock.json file is read first, and then the package.json file is read to install any updates. So your lock file does squat all, unless you use clean yeah. install. Well, NPS. <laughs> okay, so I can Okay. <laughs> Carrying on. <laughs> uh, so we have our deployment job here for prod. Uh, so I've replaced some of the functional code with comments because you guys get it. We don't need to see all of the code. Um, so we know by looking at our previous examples uh, that this job looks pretty much identical to our deployment jobs for dev and QA, except for the server. Uh, so they're all part of the deploy stage. They all load the SSH key. They all are sync. Like, they're all basically the same. Uh, so the first step into turning this into a template uh, is to rename our job. So we've named it deploy template because we're just telling everyone what it is. Uh, so you'll note the period before the name. Uh, this is a handy little tool that tells GitLab uh, that this is not just an ordinary job. Uh, it won't run it because it's hidden from the CI process. Uh, so next we'll get rid of our only and accept parameters. Um, you could have default values for them if you wanted, uh, which is totally cool to do, but for our purposes right now we won't worry about that. Uh, so now looking at the script parameter, the only thing we have left is the big problem. Uh, the server is hard-coded right into the script. Uh, to solve this, we will take advantage of variables. So variables allow us to really harness the power of GitLab CI templates. Uh, just like any other language, variables are data, stored, key value pairs, you're good. Um, you can declare variables in a few different methods and levels, uh, which we won't go too far into, but essentially, uh, you can declare them per job, per pipeline, uh, per project, and even per group inside of GitLab itself. Uh, so you can use variables pretty much anywhere you want uh, within your builds, except for a few small exceptions, uh, and those exceptions can be found in the GitLab CI documentation about variables. Um, Is so there scope? Hmm? Is there scope on variables? Yes. So depending on where you would declare them, that's where the scope is. Um, when the CI process begins on your runner, all of the variables in your various scopes are loaded as environment variables just into your terminal. Uh, so you would access them like you would any other command line environment variable. Uh, so let's see how we can use variables to finish off this template. So to declare a variable in a template, uh, we use the variables parameter, uh, which is a basic YAML array. Uh, so now that we have the target server variable available to us, uh, we can simply remove the hard-coded server and plug in our variable. Uh, so now as you can clearly see, our slides are using bash. So we access our variable through the dollar sign and then the variable name. Obviously, if you're using Windows Batch or PowerShell or something, it'll be a slightly different syntax, but you get the gist. Uh, so the next step is to actually use our template um, to allow jobs to pull from this newly created template. We use the uh, and extend its functionality. Uh, we use the extends parameter. Uh, this basically tells GitLab that when it gets to our job, it needs to go look at our template first and use that as the base job, then look at our new job and make any overrides or customizations based on that, you know, like, like a template. Uh, so let's look how we can use this template in our deployment job. 
the first step is to tell GitLab that we are extending our new template using the extends parameter. Uh, next, we need to make use of our target server variable and give it a value for this job. So in this case, just drop for uh, Finally, we'll add our only accept parameters back because uh, they're specific to our job. We need to make sure that we don't accidentally have a dev build deploy to, queue, uh, to production. That would be uh, unfortunate. Uh, so following these steps, we could upgrade our dev and QA stages as well or jobs, rather, as well. Uh, so here you can see we've extended our template, declared our variables, and made our only and accept rules. Pretend they're real only and accept rules. <laughs> uh, so while these templates help reduce duplicate code, it may not seem so important in this situation. Uh, we only have a few jobs to execute the same code. Um, but when you have multiple types of builds, multiple types of deploys, a whole bunch of tests that run before and after those deployments, uh, they, the repetition can add up really quick. Okay, so extends and variables is great. They're, they're all very nice to use. Um, but what if you have multiple projects on GitLab that need these templates. So, uh, you start off with one project with a pipeline and a template, then you add another, and another one, and more templates, more projects, more pipelines, more builds. <laughs> it's just getting ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so, you may be like our good friend Leo here. Uh, and think that that's just way too much work to support all those projects with their CI builds and all their templates. And you're right. It is way too much work. We would know. We used to do it. <laughs> we would have all of our clients' projects and all of our projects with their own CI build uh, files, all using these sort of templates we've made in our files, all extending them. And then if we updated one of the projects, we would then have to make sure to go through all of our other projects and update those as well to make sure that all of our builds are on the same, on the same uh, stage there. Uh, and this is where the final key feature of templating comes into play. Uh, the include parameter. Uh, the include parameter is a global parameter, just like when you're declaring your stages. It goes like right at the top of your GitLab CI file. Uh, it functions as a basic list of URLs, all pointing to different YAML files. Um, when you add a YAML file within the includes parameter, GitLab CI will basically look at the URL, go to that URL, and embed all of that YAML as if it were written in your CI file itself. Uh, this allows you to have a single source for template files, uh, all of which can be included, extended, and customized throughout all of your builds individually without having to update constantly. So as an example, these two slides are exactly the same as far as GitLab CI is concerned. Uh, so not only does this allow you to include templates across multiple projects, but it also drastically reduces the amount of code you have in your CI files. So. We'll end our official slide presentation with uh, some important notes to keep in mind when you're working with templates. Uh, all the parameters, like script and stage and all that, they're unique. Uh, this means that if, you have, if your template declares a stage and your job declares a different stage, when the GitLab CI runs, your job stage will be the only one that's respected. It will not look at both of them. Uh, a really important example for this is your scripts. Uh, you may have a lot of default scripts written in a template. Uh, if your job has a scripts parameter, all of your default code in your template, crushed, it's gone. You cannot have two scripts. So if you need to customize the script for this one job, even by like just ever so slightly, 
uh, you would have to rewrite all of the scripts for that job, unless you can somehow work it into variables like we did. Um, the exception to this rule is when a parameter is basically just a list of key value pairs, like variables. Uh, in that case, GitLab will merge those two parameters. So let's say you had your target server variable in your template, and then you added a site alias variable in your job itself. Your target server will be respected. They'll be merged into a list. Uh, another important note is that uh, jobs are limited to one template. You can't combine multiple templates into one, uh, which is only a temporary limitation. Uh, coming in GitLab 12, they're changing the extends parameter to take a list of templates. So you could have multiple templates combined into one job. Uh, where that could be useful is, uh, like for us, we have our basic set of like only and accept rules for deploying to different environments that we just copy throughout everything. All of our projects follow the same uh, tagging and branch naming standards. Um, it would be nice for us to have a template that is just the dev deployment categories and extend that with another template so that when we make a dev deploy, we can say take the deploy, take the dev deploy, and then we're good. Um, so we do have, I believe we have some time left. So we can do questions, uh, although we had a couple. However, we can also show you how we deploy Drupal with GitLab CI. Uh, and it's going to be very technical because we're basically going to show you how we template it all out. Okay. So, I actually have it, oh, you had it. Sorry. here. <laughs> Okay. So, is this big enough? You guys want a little bit bigger? It's good. Good. Okay. So, essentially, when we're making a build, uh, we have our template for building Drupal, uh, which essentially is just making sure Composer is run and npm is run. Um, and we add some default artifacts, just naming our artifact and how the artifact will be saved. Uh, and then we kind of customize it. What we do with our templates is we kind of make templates from our templates to import into our jobs. Uh, because basically, our dev build is going to be the same pretty much every project we do. Our Drupal dev wants to build the exact same way. So we have our build template then we have just a job that is the dev build, and then we include that throughout all of our projects. So that if we change the dev build once anywhere, all of them will update and make sure they all deploy the same way. Uh, so here you can kind of see some examples of uh, the artifacts here is a good example of where parameters that are key value pairs are merged and not crushed. Uh, so in our template, we declare the name of our artifact and what paths it needs to save as the artifact. And then in our dev build, we have artifacts again, and we're adding a new key to tell it that our dev build should expire in one day. Let's scroll that up a little bit so we can. Uh, so in this case, artifacts in both the template and the build are kept. They're just merged into one. So and then we have a slightly different process for our release builds. Uh, where we get into a lot of crazy templating is our deployment stage. Uh, so we have two different kinds of deployments. I won't go into initial deployment. Um, 
just because it's a weird use case and we have to deal a lot with Drush, which I don't want to talk about dealing with Drush. <laughs> Uh, so essentially how we deploy to Drupal is we build it all through, the, through Composer and then just use Drush site aliases to rsync everything where it needs to go. Uh, so the whole site, aside from the database, is built on our runner and then we just copy it all over. So you can see a lot of, like this is where variables come into play because you see like we have Drush site alias options, SSH options, uh, our alias group, our alias, oh, there we go, alias type, and then we SSH everything. And then we run a bunch of other commands uh, to get Drush up to date. Uh, we even wrote our own backup script because Drush 9 took out the ability to run backups on your site. Because why not? Um, <laughs> Doesn't work. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we we made our own little PHP script that <laughs> is essentially Drush Archive. Um, so we do a whole lot of things. Uh, we run the Drupal fix permissions script that you can get on Drupal.org with a little customization by us. Um, and essentially, it's all automatic. We can go from no dev site on the server at all to a completely functioning dev site with just clicking the CI build run. So is it going to be uh, So it depends on which one we're running. We have our initial Drupal deploy. This actually creates a database and gives it all that with the uh, MySQL URL. Uh, our normal deploy, we just update the data and move on. Uh, and then, after we've deployed everything, uh, we actually run a bunch of updates. So we automatically run like Drush updb. Uh, we import all of our config, uh, and we do some more uh, permission fixing, uh, just because we've noticed that. GitLab CI can sometimes screw up some of the permissions. <laughs> um, I did consider showing you a full demo of it like running, but sometimes it can take upwards of our entire presentation time <laughs> to fully deploy like a functional Drupal site. Uh, so that didn't really make a whole lot of sense unless I hit play at the beginning and then showed you the end result. Um, yeah, and so then we have it split out. So we have our, our update template, which has our basic stuff. Uh, and then we extend this template further so that we update our feature environment specifically. Uh, we update our dev environments and update our QA environments, our prod environments. Uh, and most of these are just taken from the template with a small exception of like we change the Drush alias type variable. Just so when we run Drush, it knows what server to go to, what to do. Uh, another example, are, are we on time? Oh yeah, we are, we are, we are <laughs> done, aren't we? <laughs> okay, question, yeah? Where are you fighting your SSH keys? Uh, so our SSH key, uh, is loaded. I can actually show you. We have, we've gone like all out in this template. Essentially for all of our projects, we just have a list of imported files. <laughs> and that's all our CI consists of for the most part. Uh, so uh, when we load SSH keys, uh, they are variables stored on a project level. So within GitLab, you can go into the UI and actually make variables. Uh, and those are inserted into every pipeline in that project, uh, which is where we keep the actual keys. Uh, yeah, well, they're as they're not committed to the repo, so they're they're stored as like secure variables that only maintainers and owners can actually access. And then. 
basically, we have this before script run and all it does is it looks for our variable and just loads it in. And that way, all of our jobs can access our dev and, and prod servers as needed. And another cool thing, although if you want to talk to me like after this, uh, you can come find me. Because uh, we also have stuff that like when our lint fails, it actually runs a fix and gives you that artifact so that you can download that, apply those changes, and commit them back up. Is this code you're able to share? Uh, it is technically public. I'm just going over with uh, Matt, our boss, just if we are actually going to like give it out fully. When we make the, we, we the will slides be, available? Yeah. We'll... When the slides become available, you'll, you'll, get the, well, you'll get the URL. We'll link to what you can Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you.